Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kevin. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Strategy Best Practices, sponsored today by Cambridge Semantics. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights by or highlights by a LinkedIn or other social using hashtag data ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to open and access either the Q&A or the chat panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and we'll likewise send a link to the recording of the session as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Sean for a brief word from our sponsor, Cambridge Semantics. Sean, hello and welcome. Hello there, Shannon, and thank you for having me and Happy New Year to everybody from a very sunny and unseasonably warm uh, Boston. Uh, uh, so we're very pleased to be uh, sponsoring this first webinar, and um, I thought I'd uh, spend my time with a, a couple of remarks, uh, really, to um, help people understand where we think we fit into the data landscape. Uh, Cambridge Semantics is a knowledge graph company, but we're uh, rather peculiar on the knowledge graph front because we're, we're um, really about uh, OLAP data integration using knowledge graphs. So um, as I prepared a, a couple of slides uh, to, for this uh, talk, um, I thought I would uh, just uh, kind of compare and contrast uh, what uh, the, uh, these emerging architectures that people are starting to talk a lot, a lot about are, and, uh, and, and they are uh, the ones you hear about a lot that these days are data mesh and data fabric. And uh, what I was surprised to find as I read a lot of different uh, definitions um, all over the web and um, is that the, the data mesh concept, I think, is, is much better, better defined and that the people writing about the data mesh don't have such a good idea as to what really the data fabric people are, are thinking about and, and, and doing. So it's, it's quite interesting, the data mesh approach. Um, and, and so what I really did was collect together a, a list of snippets of, of things from different papers and different uh, articles, uh, which sort of highlighted what people are saying about uh, each of these two things. Uh, data mesh uh, would appear to be a sort of a human centric uh, approach where, where uh, the production of data is devolved down to the domain of, of people who really have owned that data and are ready to clean it up and look after it. And they are prepared to sort of offer the service to other parts of the business. And it seems to me that that really sort of is a kind of an architecture, even maybe a philosophy that fits pretty well with where most businesses are, because, you know, it's, it's really not particularly product centric and it's, and it allows people to build on more or less what they've got. So it's, it's kind of business as usual, but with a, a spin around, um, you know, how are we going to devolve um, the ownership of data out, you know, away from maybe very central approaches down to, to where, um, where it's best, uh, best done, you know, according to philosophy at, At the, at the place where the data is come from the point of view of, of definitions. Uh, well, one is that it's, it's really able to automate everything using um, metadata and, uh, and um, instead it's, a, it's a, an approach that doesn't use humans at all. And, and, and those of you who uh, I'm sure probably all of you who are data experts uh, know there's just no, nothing at all at the moment that allows you to just simply automate the process of data integration and, and delivery. Um, so that seems like a little bit of a canard, but, um, but it certainly um, is an approach where, um, where people try to take a, a, um, a wider look at the data in the organization from an approach uh, where they want to create data products that, um, that essentially uh, come from multiple places. Um, and, um, and graph technology is, is being seen as a technology that really sits in the middle of that. So, so from my perspective, we're, we're really seeing um, uh, and I agree with the, you know, what what most of the people write in these papers that these two approaches aren't really um, antagonistic or, or or exclusive in any way. In fact, I, when I when we we deliver our software often as a data fabric, I'm seeing the same sort of um, devolved ownership also showing up, um, uh, which the data mesh people talk about in the same projects. So um, I don't think it really matters. Um, 
you know, whether you're a data mesh or data fabric person, I suspect you're going to pick the best things that make sense out of both uh, sort of approaches and, and do what you need to do to get, uh, to get uh, the business happy. So um, talking about uh, knowledge graphs, um, really, where do they fit in for, for both of these types of approaches? Um, the way I think about it is an, as an overlay. So it's an overlay technology that could be over a single domain um, uh, and, and help a, a, a business group deliver data out of that domain, a la data mesh, or it could be uh, people taking a wider view where they're building a, a, a data fabric, which really has to blend data from across an enterprise and even data from outside the enterprise. And the product that we have that does this is an OLAP uh, graph uh, system. Um, it's, it's massively parallel, so it can scale to a, a large amount of data. You should think about it as a kind of a snowflake for, for graph data. Um, and it allows you to amalgamate um, or virtualize uh, large amounts of data and connect it all up. And it, but it does it as an overlay to existing technology. So there's no, no, no need to throw anything out. Now, why knowledge graphs? Um, and, uh, the reason is that we, we like them so much is because they're able to really give you a very true representation of, of an underlying reality that you're trying to model uh, in a way that uh, is just awfully difficult to do with, with tables um, and, um, and, and, and structures like uh, XML and JSON, which tend to not be very good at the relationships between things um, uh, and are kind of forced when you're trying to do that and, and end up being a bit impractical. Knowledge graphs allow you to really represent much more complex realities. That, that thing on the right-hand side there with the thousands of, of circles and arrows and so on, the lines connecting them up the edges, that's a model. Um, and, and every circle represents what in a relational world would be a table or even a couple of tables. Um, can you imagine trying to manage that uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a data warehouse? Not really, but Knowledge Graph gives you the tools to be able to deal with something like that. So it allows you to essentially, in an evolutionary way, push data into a, a, a graph at a sort of a logical level, described at a logical level, often described using the business vocabulary of the consumers of the data. And then when you have additional data you want to bring into this, uh, this picture, you simply have to find a, a place where, where the new data coming in, uh, you can create a, a, a line between that and anything else on the graph. And now that data becomes part of the graph too. And, and thereby you build out a fabric of connectedness, which you can query across and ask very complex questions. And, and that's what we allow our customers to do, which is to create views into these complex data structures, which end up being the data products that they deliver. Um, and as I said, it's very easy to, to bring new data um, into the system by simply finding a logical place that it attaches. Um, this is how, um, this is one of our customers actually, we, we, we sit on top of the Cedar data lake at the FDA, where they've built a, a 360 view of every drug submission ever delivered so far. So in this case, it's a moderate, yeah, a fairly modest knowledge graph. It's, it's 14 underlying data sources, some of them with very complex schema, 300,000 drugs, 73 years of historical data, and millions of documents. And you can see in the sort of really dumbed down view how we build the graph out of those different underlying sources. On the left, you've got a table and the, the product information is pulled out and, and, and then you've got a second table in the middle and some documents on the right, which you'd use NLP to extract data. And, it, and what you're essentially doing is, is casting that into a graph. And we use ontologies to define, if you like, the template for the types of things or the, the model of things that we're storing. And so this is what a, a graph looks like, but obviously you're seeing here, you know, a few dozen um, uh, facts uh, that we've stored, but, but a real graph like this one uh, would be in the, the multiple billions of, uh, of, of facts that we'd be storing in the underlying uh, graph engine. Um, let's have a look. And the way we do this is, is in a system that uh, allows us to essentially bring in the data sources wherever they are. Sometimes we don't bring them in. Sometimes we virtualize them and queries to that part of the graph are pushed down as pushed down queries. Um, uh, there can be unstructured data. So you can, if you've got NLP that works, that can extract facts from um, documents or tweets or, or, uh, or really slides or emails or anything, those facts can be brought out and each of them is stored separately in, as subgraphs in the overall graph. And then we can use uh, graph transformations to essentially coerce that data into consumable models that different domain users would understand. 
and and those would be data products um, and then of course the data products are consumable through apis through dashboards whether it be you know existing bi tools or our own codeless graph uh, dashboarding tool um, so that's more or less how we assemble these graphs now some customers are building out huge uh, fabrics um, and they're doing dozens and dozens of graph solutions each of which leaves more and more of the underlying data exposed for reuse by other solutions in combination with other data sets or other parts of the business and here we have a, a large manufacturer that has is looking at over over years um, building many many solutions that that read as data products across a wider a wider graph um, that they're building um, across their entire sort of as designed, where the products are designed as, as they make them, monitoring production lines and what happened historically. And then as the products are used in the field where they're generating data, and sometimes you're going to want to connect the data that's generated with the, the data that was in the design data to help you improve materials and, and so on and improve the designs. So this is an example of, of an active fabric sort of emerging um, somewhere in, in Europe. Um, I'm going to finish there um, by just pointing you two resources. Um, one is uh, uh, something I was involved in writing a, a year ago, which is how to get started with knowledge graphs and the underlying technologies, the triples, the ontologies, and just how to how to bootstrap this. And that's free, and you can just download it. We, we wrote it with O'Reilly. Um, and the second one is a great book that I've recently become aware of and, and uh, been talking to the gentleman who's the author, which is Data Management at Scale. There's about to be a second edition, um, I see from Amazon, there's a first edition already, um, and I would highly recommend that book. It's, uh, it's the gentleman who wrote it is enormously experienced, and, uh, and I've really enjoyed uh, reading it, and I'm pleased to say we've got a few pages in it where we're describing how, how we fit it. Um, but uh, but it is a really excellent book. So with that, uh, uh, welcome to the webinar, and I'm going to hand it back to, uh, to Shannon and, and Peter. Thanks. John, thank you so much. And thanks to Cambridge Semantics for sponsoring today's webinar and help kicking off the year with our webinar season. Really appreciate and help making these webinars happen. And if you have questions for Sean, uh, he will be joining us for the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. So feel free to submit your, submit your questions in the Q&A portion of your screen for that. So now let me introduce to you our speaker for the webinar series, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an acknowledged data management authority and associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, president of DAMA International and associate director, director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. For more than 35 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in 30 countries, including some of the world's most important. Among his 12 books are many firsts, starting before Google, before data was big, and before data science, Peter has founded several organizations that have helped more than two. 200 organizations leverage data specific savings, which have been measured at more than 1.5 billion US dollars. His latest endeavor is anything awesome. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. And happy new year to you, Shannon. And Sean, thanks for a great little tutorial on the knowledge graphs. We'll look forward to you joining us back at the uh, top of the hour as we finish up this particular presentation as some questions already in the chat for you. So that's a uh, great generated some interest uh, around all of this. Uh, lots of material today, folks, and uh, we're just going to dive right in. I want to draw your attention to the Malcolm Gladwell quote here. Practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing you do that makes you good. And I love that particular statement. I'm a musician, so I understand practice, practice all the time. Bottom line up front is that in looking at more than 20 years of multi-page data strategies, they just aren't terribly useful as the first one. And that when you spend time trying to perfect something at the beginning of your journey, uh, you lose the opportunity to invest equally into the process component of that. So cycling through improvements is a better way to think about using data strategically than a grand plan. A little bit of context here, strategy is a repetitive process that can be improved. There is dependency in the sense that the data strategy exists solely to support the organizational strategy, that that evolution of the strategy should be looked at in context of it providing additional capabilities or improving the existing capabilities that you have. 
and that the actual outputs of the plans are of limited value. Just go back a couple of years and, and look at everybody's strategic plan that didn't include being locked down for a couple of years while we waited out a pandemic uh, on this. Lots of plans also overemphasize technology. And I think one of the things that Sean said in particular is that there's a lot of things that we can do that will knit together many other things. So we'll come back and revisit that at the end. The last one is a musician's question. How does one get to Carnegie Hall or Nirvana or wherever one is trying to get to? And the answer is practice, practice, practice. So diving right in, we're going to talk about what is a strategy? How does that relate to data? And how do the two work together? We're going to look at data strategy in relation to data governance. We're going to look at some very challenging prerequisites, which seems to be the part that most people leave out of their plan uh, on this. And there's a, a then repeating process that we can put in place that will help all of us get better. And as I said, we'll swing back around about 45 minutes and uh, do some Q&A on all of that. So let's dive right in. <clears throat> First of all, many people think that strategy is complicated. It turns out it can be made complicated, particularly as the price of the consultants go up higher and higher. But what strategy is really all about is doing the same thing for most of what we do and changing some aspects of it. And if we can get to that point of changing some aspects of it, we really have a very good opportunity then to move forward. The way to look at this is a wonderful talk from Simon Sinek. If you still go back and do TED Talks, he starts out his by saying people are pretty good at describing what they do. We're less good at describing how we do it, and we're not very good at all about describing why. Strategy is what must provide that why in order to do it. And this is sort of self-evident at this point, what motivates people isn't what you do. People don't look at what I do and say, hey, I want to be a data evangelist, which is, by the way, a great job uh, on this. But it's that we can use data to help people out. And the why is the important part. Again, to pick a particular quote here, uh, Martin Luther King had said, I have a plan uh, instead of I have a dream. Uh, it wouldn't have been quite as uh, moving a speech uh, around that or as effective a speech as well. So what is strategy? Well, we start out first of all, by understanding that it came from the military and that only about 1950 or so did the business group start picking this up, business consultants and things. And they've moved it into this idea that it's a master plan or a game plan. And you know, all of these things are good, but it's really not the way to think about it. And it's not how it was originally used. See, in the business world, a strategy is much more of a thing, whereas if we go back to the military origins of it, and the definition from the military is a pattern in a stream of decisions. Well, how does that actually work out? Turns out pretty well. And more importantly, you'll see that the second definition is a process-oriented decision, which says when we're making decisions, we ought to be looking for certain types of things. I'll give you a couple of quick examples on this. Uh, at Walmart, uh, they business strategy, if you do anything with them or understand anything about the company, is everyday low price. That's not anything super secret. In fact, they've done such a good job of making sure that everybody who works with, surrounds, is in contact with Walmart, understands everyday low price. And more importantly, when a technology or business person within Walmart is making decisions, if they err on the side that supports the business strategy, there is no discipline that occurs around that. Second example, of strategy here is Wayne Gretzky. Uh, we're not necessarily in Canada right at the moment, but if you know anything about him, he's got a great strategy where he says he skates to where he thinks the puck will be. Because of course, if you're chasing a hard uh, plastic object around the ice, you will never catch up with it uh, in that context. A lot of really good stuff on uh, the Wikipedia page that expands on his idea around here. Let's take a third example of strategy just very briefly. How do I defeat the competition when they're forced Forces are bigger than mine. And the answer, of course, is divide and conquer. Uh, that is, again, our pattern in a stream of decisions. So I'm showing you here lines of supply that, uh, in this case, the British are shown in red, and they are supplied out of Ostend that I've circled in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. And also facing blue, the Napoleon in blue, is the Prussian troops, and they are supplied 
out of liege. Now, Napoleon, being a master strategist, said, great, the process of divide and conquer is literally perfect for this. If I hit them in exactly the right place, I'll do it here one more time just to make sure that you can see that, I can get the two of these armies to fall backwards. If an army is falling backwards, they are much more likely to fall towards their food rather than away from their food. So this is a brilliant bit of strategy. We're not done yet, however. We still have to go and continue. Then the smaller force, remember Napoleon's in blue, has to turn around and defeat, in this case, the Prussians first, and then go out and defeat the British. So again, great example of strategy. This is still taught in US DOD schools uh, that we have. It turned out it wasn't successful. That's a different issue, but we understand it as a strategy. And let's take that third strategy apart for just a minute. So let me get this straight. This is the uh, people who are receiving the strategy and they're saying, we're going to hit both of the opposing armies at us at once at just the right spot. And then we're all going to turn right and defeat the Prussians. And then we're all going to turn left and defeat the British. And oh, by the way, will you please do this uh, while somebody is shooting furiously at you? Uh, well, that's probably not uh, a recipe for success. It certainly wasn't in this particular instance in here. Uh, think about strategy again. And if you've got a book and says, well, here's we are the good guys and here's the bad guys and here's how we proceed, that's great. But you're going to need a different plan if the good guys, us, are up here and the bad guys are down here or vice versa if the bad guys are up here and we are down there. Each of these is going to require a different kind of planning. Remember, again, a pattern in a stream of decisions and more importantly for what we're talking about in the business world, because we're not actually out there trying to conquer France or anything like that strategy guides work group activities whether they know what the strategy is or not they all work towards what they think they know is the correct strategy around this and strategy of course that winds up on a shelf is just absolutely useless and so we have to be able to pull something off uh, in order to do this uh, Again, you saw this if you saw the adverts for this particular webinar. In preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but that planning is indispensable. Thank you, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, one of our former presidents around this. Or Mike Tyson, if you prefer to go with him. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So let's talk now about a data strategy here. It's the highest level of guidance that's available. It focuses on data activities. Excuse me, I said it wrong. Focuses data activities on business goal achievement. And that really is key. So I'm glad I caught myself and didn't say it wrong. Uh, provides guidance when faced with a stream of decisions or uncertainty. Again, your data strategy most usefully articulates how data can be best used to support the organizational strategy, but it almost always involves a matter of remediation and proactive measures. There's a lot of data debt in our organizations that we need to work within. When you're measuring the effectiveness of the data strategy, we should be able to determine its effectiveness over time. We should also be able to observe that its length should be shorter than the organizational strategy, if that's the, the case and the organization's quite good at. There should be versions uh, of the strategy so that when you hand people version one of the strategy and then you achieve it, and then you hand them version two, they're not confused. Uh, finally, there's a way of measuring common understanding among all of these pieces. And if you really do want to put it all on one page, here's a good way to do it. This is courtesy of my uh, good friend, Chris Bradley uh, over there, but I, I don't recommend this because it's not going to be language that people can understand. That said, it doesn't hurt at all to put what you're trying to do on an infographic. So let's look at our two planning options that we have here. You can plan the entire process at the beginning or you can use iterative strategy cycles. And those strategy cycles give us the opportunity to incorporate corrective feedback in here and use this in a way that helps your data program over time increase its capacity and improve its operations while changing the focus from uh, reactive to proactive all the way around uh, in order to do this. And yet what I've seen over and over and over again from organizations is that they'll go in and they say, well, our strategy is data science, right? Well, that's not a strategy. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Sean will agree with me on that when he gets back up in here as well. So let's just do a quick recap. Uh, so far, we've talked about what is a strategy. And again, it's not a thing, it's a process. And a data strategy then is the idea of supporting the organization's 
process with data. And that's the best way we can get them to work together, looking at this pattern and a stream of decisions. So if I'm looking at a context here and say I have a particular strategic focus and we're going to call it space, again, physical space, for example, um, we might you know, hit that one first and then come back and focus on a strategy that we're calling cost uh, in order to do this. A data strategy is absolutely necessary for effective data governance in here. Now, I'm going to put up seven data governance definitions. Please don't read them because I'm going to tear them all down here in just a second. Just imagine, in this case, trying to talk to somebody uh, about it, or better still, getting on an elevator with a top executive who looks over and says, hey, Peter, you work for me. Can you explain to me a little bit about what this data governance stuff is? And of course, as soon as I try to say, hey, it's about decision, decision rights and things, you know, I'm not going to have a good conversation with them. So I like to keep definitions short enough that executives can focus on them and understand them usefully. Data governance then is managing data with guidance. If we look at it from this perspective, first thing you might ask is that, oh, so if we're not managing data with guidance, we're managing data without guidance? That's probably not a good idea uh, around that. Similarly, I also, as we go higher in the organization, more towards the strategic level, I change the definition slightly, as you can see there, not just managing data, but managing data decisions with guidance. And that is really critical because most people don't know they're making data decisions. And that's something we have to work on is making them understand this because data is the only resource that we have that doesn't deplete, doesn't degrade. It's a durable resource at the strategic level. And when we compare that to other assets that we have, it really compares very favorably, winning in many cases in some people's ideas. Um, the asset, of course, is that data is not the new oil. Uh, everybody says this. If you Google the term, you'll see 5 million hits on it. I like to say, let's just put a word, I mean, a letter out in front of that oil part and call it soil. There's two things that are important from that perspective. The first one is that you don't just randomly garden by flinging seeds about the yard and hoping good things happen. You carefully prepare the bed. You put things in it carefully and you nurture them as they're growing. The other part of it that's important is that you don't plant things on Monday and expect to eat them on Friday. It takes time to nurture in this case. On the other hand, we do need some sizzle in order to sell this stuff. So whatever we can do to make sure that people are paying attention to it, that is fabulous. But as an asset, then, what we really have is the idea that data deserves its own strategy. It has attention on par to similar other organizational assets, and it requires some professional administration to make up for past neglect. Now, just very briefly here, uh, an example, in 2020, American Airlines was valued by the marketplace, the value of the stock, at $6 billion, and yet they're data in their frequent flyer program was valued at tens of billions of dollars more than that. The same thing was true here for United. I contend that this is the data debt that most organizations, both organizations are facing, which is the idea that you can't start off in a straight fashion and simply apply new stuff. You've got to get back to zero. And it means involves undoing a bunch of things. And now you get to go out and try to do even better with all of this. So data debt slows progress, decreases quality, and increases cost. And it's a major barrier to using data strategically in your organization. When you look at it from that perspective, you're really talking about also separating the wheat from the chaff around this, and that much of your data is not as useful as people seem to think it is. Uh, first place to start off with is, is well-organized data worth more? And I think the answer to that can be proven, yes, just going back to our pre-information age metadata. Uh, in the old days, of course, if I just handed a series of pages to you without putting them in order and giving a table of contents and things like that, it wouldn't be useful. In fact, if you want to make it a very graphic, just grab somebody's book, take the tap off it, uh, again, remove the spine, and pretty soon the knowledge starts disappearing very, very quickly. Well, of course, now we've proven that better organized data increases in value, and now I'm going to give you a very disappointing statistic that 80% minimally of your data is ROT. ROT is an acronym that stands for data that is redundant obsolete or trivial. And when you think that most enterprise data is never analyzed, this does represent some very nice savings opportunities and ability to 
pare down the general problem uh, problem space uh, and all this. So who would be more uniquely qualified to accomplish this but your own folks who really do understand the data? Now, strategy and governance have to work together. I mentioned before the support for the organizational strategy is the only purpose of a data strategy. And data strategy is what focuses the efforts around data governance. So what are the data assets doing that could better support strategy and how well is that data strategy working? Similarly, however, in Peter's world, at least, Peter likes to have data governance have an impact on IT and IT projects as well. That's not currently the case in many organizations, but it is uh, getting closer to that. I wouldn't show everybody that picture. I'd uh, instead show them this one, which is a little bit uh, simpler and adds in our real worker bees in this context, our data stewards. Now, our goal here from a data strategy is make sure that it's expressed in terms of business goals and that the language of data governance is metadata because only by including those two components in here can we really make the efforts that are doing in data governance and data stewards uh, really tangible to management so that they understand why we're doing things and how it's going. Uh, so key for this, obviously, is to improve your organization's data, improve the way people use their data, and improve how people use data to support strategy. That's a three-part process, which is a lot more than just making data of better quality. Uh, next chunk here, we're going to dive into prerequisites, and these are the things that we need to do in order to work with this starting from a neutral position, whereas most organizations are starting with a deficit. When somebody is approached from a strategy perspective, the typical approach for most consultancies is to come in and say, business needs, great, here's our solution. Again, this is wrong. Thank you for allowing me to sample Morgan Freeman there and say that is wrong. Why is that wrong? Well, it leaves out the most important component of it, which is what is the current maturity or state of the organization that does exist. Uh, again, imagine having the uh, handing the keys to your brand new Tesla to a 16-year-old driver, and it's just snowed and, and uh, uh, you know atmospheric uh, uh, hurricane or whatever it is, and telling them to go out and practice. Right? Well, you wouldn't expect good results on that. Similarly. If we don't find strategic data imperatives that are matching our capabilities and our business needs, we will not be able to implement this. Data strategy then is implemented in two phases. The first one is a series of prerequisites. The second one is once we have gotten off the ground and are flying, we want to develop a repeatable process. Uh, we're going to go through three sub phases in that phase one, prepare for dramatic change and determine how to do the work. Two, recruit a qualified data executive uh, in order to do this and other talent that we're going to need, and then three, eliminating the seven data deadly sins. So we're going to start off with the dramatic change piece on this, and this is really not at all surprising. When we talk about CIOs are really not the chief information officer. In fact, when I wrote one of the first books on it, the case for the chief data officer, and they translated it into Chinese, the title came back, Chief Data Officer Combat, which I thought was wonderful. Because now we're asking, in this case, a CIO who has the title information in their uh, title and chief data officer, well, they're both kind of fighting over the same thing, are they not? Now, I contend that most CIOs are really chief integration officers or chief information technology technology officers around that. But whenever we bring these two individuals together, there is confusion, uncertainty, and doubt. And there are a couple of really good examples of how to do this. I don't have time to get into them here. But what it really evolves around is change management and leadership. And there are a group of dedicated professionals who do a great job helping organizations think about change. Now, this is something we're going to have to explain to our younger generations. This is a physical lock that you're looking at. Obviously, it's uh, uh, the way it keys on this, but turns out that organizational change from a strategy perspective is about the same kind of a process. When I look at an organization and I see, uh, I'll just pick the, the middle line there, uh, vision, skills, incentive, and an action plan, but I see frustration, I know they're missing resources. And this is a wonderful uh, model here done by Mary Lippitt, uh, who did a great job. And, and the point of the diagram, just like the key, is that unless you have all of these things lining up at once, you will not change the organization uh, in order to do this. And culture is the biggest impediment to shifting organizational thinking about data. You can't just say we're going to 
to do data better and not have an actual plan in order to do this. Uh, I have a, a, a absolutely free of charge case study that you're welcome to download if you want to learn more about that particular piece. So prepare for dramatic change because it is a different type of a world that we're working. Two, recruit knowledgeable uh, enterprise data executives. If you want to call it a CDO, that's okay as well. And I'm going to talk about Enron. And you may go, wait a minute, how did we get there? Sorry to give you a little bit of whiplash. But uh, unfortunately, most people don't get the lessons that came out of Enron. Now, first of all, I'm going to talk about the book being a great book to take to the beach. It's a really wonderful uh, description of the whole story. But Enron in 2001 suffered the largest Chapter 11 in history. Uh, um, the, in August, the stock was down to 26 cents a share from a high of $90. And from having been listed as the most innovative company for six years in a row, turns out they were the trickiest criminals that were out there in a row. And as they were circling the drain and about to go under, they got married to a company called Dynergy, which brought seven excuse me, several billion dollars in dowry to them. They just said, we'll get, we think you're a great company. We want you to keep going. Here's a bunch of money. And Enron spent the entire amount of billions of dollars in a week. And this is the time, you know, when you're getting together with somebody and getting married or learning about relationships and all that sort of stuff, probably a good time to have a conversation about how you manage money before you do anything serious about it. Uh, Enron and Dynergy didn't. And Dynergy found out that any person at Enron could write a check for any amount of money for any purchase at any point in time. And they went back to Dynergy for more money at the end of the week. And Dynergy said, what happened to the several billion dollars that I gave you last week? And Enron said, I don't know. Now, everybody, I believe, agrees that that is not good fiscal management. It is, in fact, bad fiscal management. And that we know this because we have objective qualifications for leadership in the finance area, CPA, Masters of Accountancy, other types of things. But when we look at what's going on with people who work with data, that would be the definition of a knowledge worker, I believe. We teach them generally and have taught them generally nothing about it, and yet 100% of them use it every single day. And IT professionals, even less, we teach them one course on how to build a new database, which means that smart managers who believe in the curriculums that we've been pushing for the last couple of years, and I'm saying this as a university professor, we haven't done as good a job in that area as we could because they think we don't need people in this because we're not building a new database. We're merging two databases. I have literally had those conversations with business leaders around that. And of course, if we've taught them nothing but how to build a new database for the last 30 years, is it any surprise that one of our biggest problems from a societal perspective is that there are too many darn databases out there? Well, thank you, Abraham. Maslo, that is absolutely correct. This leads a lot of organizations into something called a bad data decisions spiral. The idea is that most business decision makers are not data knowledgeable, and consequently, the technical decision makers are not either. That leads to a falling down of the creek. It just goes further and further and further. And if the technical decision makers aren't any good about this, we get what are called bad data decisions. And if we have bad data decisions, that results in poor treatment of data assets and poor quality of data, which leads to poor organizational outcomes. Uh, yes, lather, rinse, and repeat. How do we get out of this? Well, this is wrong. thank you again, Morgan Freeman. Yes, it is wrong. Consider an example implementing Salesforce.com. A decision that might be made that wouldn't be recognized as a data decision might be that we want to have Salesforce installed by, oh, let's just say January 1st uh, of the year. But if you put Salesforce out there with poor quality data in it, I guarantee you that the customers of Salesforce will not be able to tell the difference between Salesforce and Salesforce having bad data in it. Uh, this lack of focus around data has been really problematic. Again, we have CIOs that are up there, but they're not doing the same kinds of things that our chief financial officers are doing. And the chief financial officer doesn't balance the books, the risk officer doesn't test the software, the medical officer doesn't perform surgery, and our hiring panels are even less likely to acquire good data help. So how are you gonna get access to good quality people? Ask your competition. 
talk to some specific headhunters who specialize in it, but do not assume that people in your organization have the ability to go in and select a good data leader in there, unless they've had some specified training. So we need a top job in this area. Uh, again, I like to call it the top data job, enterprise data executive, chief data officer, whatever we're going to call it. They're going to run a data governance organization and other things, and they should be dedicated solely to data asset leveraging unconstrained by an IT project mindset and reporting directly to the business. Now, the challenge that we've had around this is that most of them get that process started and they kind of make people upset. So it's nice to have the ability to say, you know, maybe you should rent that first strategy data leader and do something along those lines without having to dive into it just that far. Let somebody else take the grunt, uh, the brunt that has to occur as somebody's going through this and really upsetting things. The last component of this real quickly are the seven deadly data sins. Uh, again, they are uh, not pride and envy and greed and hatred on this, but there are seven of them there. I'm going to start with number two, which is that most organizations don't have qualified data leadership. They are not able to implement a robust programmatic means of sharing data. And they're not aligning the data program to the IT projects, failing to adequately manage expectations, not sequencing data strategy implementation. Uh, again, I'm going to give you just an example on that one here, just so that you see they're not just empty words. Most organizations, when they're doing data strategy, have a choice of two outcomes. Things will be faster, better, cheaper, as in our internal processes will be better, or we'll do something innovative. And the innovative stuff may or may not be uh, profitable. So it's really critical to start out with the save some money so that people don't have any question as to what it is that you're doing. Finally, uh, seventh one, uh, of course, we're counting on sixes here, uh, failing to address the cultural and the change management challenges is a sure way of failing this. But the number one piece there is not really understanding data-centric thinking. I've collected words over the years. People like to use these different ones to say, hey, data-driven, data-centric, focus first, provocative or whatever it is, all great sentiments and wonderful things to do, but what does any of this actually mean? And I don't think anybody has anything concrete on it. So once again, I'm trying to put a little bit of meat on the bones here, and I went back to the Agile Manifesto for software development just to see if I could get some inspiration from it. And it turns out we've absolutely agreed as a society that the fastest way to develop higher quality software faster all right, is to follow agile practices. But here's the source of agile. It's literally those words on the left-hand side of your screen there. So I thought maybe we could do something similar here and look at something I'm calling the data doctrine here. And it starts out exactly the same way that the other one does. We're uncovering better ways of developing IT systems by doing it and by helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value, and again, you'll notice there are four things down below, and just like the Agile Manifesto, uh, absolutely, while there is value to the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. And I think that's an important component. Let's walk through a couple of, sorry, each of the, the four of these things. What this really means is that an IT program is often seen as developing capabilities to an organization. Certainly implementing mobile in a group that doesn't have access to mobile makes perfectly good sense. On the other hand, if we don't put anything on those mobile devices that is useful to the business, having that technical capability is not important. So the data program must drive what's happening in the IT programs. That's one measure. We, at the second one, look often at, oh, we've got to get everybody off of Windows NT. Now, just a little quick side note here, but the US Navy for several years uh, has paid Microsoft millions and mil tens of millions of dollars to keep NT platforms running on some systems that they had 
for a while there. Uh, those systems were very good, but they couldn't actually port them over to Windows 11. So what is the business value of getting Windows 11? Well, if Windows 11 locks your security down and prevents your organization from having a data breach, that's really great. But generally, you're not going to get a, a really good bang out of that particular buck. So informed information investing on the left-hand side of that equation. Shared organizational data that has some stability over IT components uh, that are evaluated in there. Once again, if I've got an opportunity to do something cool with technology, which is great, or I've got the ability to develop and make maybe a pile of data that's good in one part of our organization, accessible and useful to another part of our organization, that might be a very, very, mu very much uh, uh, appreciated investment in that context here. And finally, the last one is that we have data reuse over the acquisition of new data sources. I've already given you the statistic that 80% of the data in your organizations is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. But at the same time, if we can reuse data, that would work. Now, I've worked for many, many different organizations over my 40 years in the business here. And one of the first questions I always get asked when I come into organizations is, Peter, can you go out and find out if we're buying our own data from somebody else? And the answer has always been yes. I've always found that uh, that organizations are actually paying for their own data to come back to them through some sort of advisory service or something. It's absolutely hilarious to look at that. So let's think about these things. And this may not be right for your organization, but I think it puts a little bit more on the bone than saying, hey, we're going to be data driven. Well, this is what it means to be data driven in this particular context. So let's go back to strategy here. Again, we've talked about the lack of organizational readiness, which is why most of these, like, again, just imagine, uh, you know, you're at the top of a, a ski slope and somebody says, well, you've never skied before, but don't worry, we've got the trail all smooth and here's some great technology that'll help you. Eh, it's probably not going to be a good outcome on that. That it's going to not compensate for these lack of competencies here. And that we really do need to have from a data strategy, also people that can implement that strategy in support of the organization. And took a look at those seven deadly data sins to see how problematic they are for your specific environment in here. So the last component here then is what I like to call lather, rinse, and repeat. Now, of course, if you were reading the shower uh, excuse me, reading the shampoo bottle in the shower, you would never get out of the shower because, of course, it's an infinite loop and it's not going to be helpful with us. But it is a shorthand term for iterative and, more importantly, iterative improvement around these things. So, again, we are right here now at this. We've gone through phase one. We've prepared for dramatic change. We've recorded a qualified, knowledgeable team to do this or identified it from within the organization. And we're starting to eliminate the various data sins that we have out there. Now we're ready to start practicing. And there turns out to be a five-step process that hopefully will strike you all as not anything terribly original, because I don't believe in reinventing the wheel uh, on this. But let's just look at the, the iteration here. Identify the primary constraint, keeping data from fully supporting strategy in this particular uh, environment, which means you have to not just look at volume of data, but you have to look at how much the value of that data is in that context. Exploit organizational efforts to remove that constraint. Subordinate everything else to this and elevate the data constraint. If that doesn't work, start over again. So there you have it, lather, rinse, and repeat. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. First of all, let's go back to the data strategy framework here. Remember again, not the best thing to do by simply going out, what does the business need, but only going forward when I have a match between a business need and an existing capability at the organizational level, then I can start to plan out the execution, which means we get a roadmap. And from this roadmap perspective, it's really, really important to balance your activities. Now, I've had a CEO one time tell me that uh, they had given the uh, the data group, I'm sorry, CIO at one point tell me they did gave the data group five years to come up with some value. They knew it was going to take some time to get running. But the problem is most CIOs are still only lasting two to four years, according to Gartner, on this. Now, the balance part of this is that if I'm showing only business value on the left-hand side, I'm likely erring so far on that business side that once I finish getting value, I won't have the ability to go back 
and find another trove, if you will, another place to go in and, and do some data work. So we also have to look at the right-hand side of the diagram here and balance the business value from new capabilities, because we do need to have things that we in the academic community haven't taught IT people to do. Business people don't understand uh, how to do this stuff. So we're going to have to learn some new capabilities in order to come up with the way these things work. And this is what I mean by a balanced framework here, where you have some business value and some other ways to do this. Now, there's a couple other books out there on data strategy. It'd be foolish to pretend that there weren't. And when you read them, they, they kind of say that, well, data strategy really needs to be the sum of your data governance strategy and your metadata strategy and your data quality strategy. I'm not going to read the rest of these, but you get the picture. My first question is, and I wish we had Instapoles here, is you know, how many of you have even one of these nine things? And I didn't even list all the things I could list. So trying to say that your data strategy is the summation of all that is not really a good way to do it. Wrong. Again, our third sample of Morgan Freeman there, right? Yeah, it doesn't work that way. So what does work? Well, again, if I attack this with a particular method, I'm going to call it strategy cycle one in this case, I'm going to follow this process that I just described for you very briefly through there. And if I erase it at that point, then I've solved that particular strategic objective. If I haven't, I need to go around the wheel again and rethink the process. Hopefully this is putting some of your minds uh, in, in memory of some things that uh, will become obvious in just a couple of slides uh, on this to take a look. Then we can go to strategy cycle two. Okay, again, remember we said we're gonna have versions and that idea would be at version two, we're going to work on cost uh, in order to do this. So this allows us to focus on data debt in particular, finding the highest value constraint and practicing valuing things as well. If the constraint is not addressed, start over again in order to do it. Now, if you haven't already seen through here, yes, this is the book that I'm drawing from inspiration uh, on this. It is called The Goal. If you haven't read it, it's a famous business text. And what it talks about is something called the theory of constraints. Any system is going to be limited in achieving goals by a small number of constraints. There's always one constraint and this focusing process, find the constraint, restructure the rest of the organization to address it, find that weak link in the chain. Because if we haven't gotten rid of the weak link in the chain, we're more at risk than other parts of the organization in order to do this. This whole process here is not new. It's a 30 year piece. And the wonderful thing about it is that many people on the business side will also recognize this as a very appropriate way to put strategy in place in organizations. Each cycle therefore has a specific focus. We're going to do something to achieve some goal. In the theory of constraints generic plan, it kind of looks like this. We start out here by identifying the constraint. That's just very simply stating the problem. Then we exploit the constraint. We make decisions about how we're going to take that constraint. If you recall the book, The Goal at All, they had a new piece of equipment that came in. So the first exploit the constraint question was, how are we going to use the new piece of equipment? Similarly, you all may be buying a, a wonderful product from Sean. And so your first question is, how are we going to use that particular constraint to, uh, to do that? Now, if that doesn't immediately fix things, your next step is to subordinate all of the non-constraints. The key there is to work effectively, not efficiently in that. Because most often the case is when we find things and add a new variable into our system, it changes the way things work around. Yeah. Then our process overall is throughput. So this is now looking at alleviating the constraint, attempting to increase capacity in light of new system demands and non-constraint surplus that we have in there. Uh, again, you'll see different organizations treat these in different ways, but it's a very, very sane and repeatable process. And oh, by the way, if we haven't fixed it, we need to go around and rethink our specifics that we were looking at. And gosh, golly, in a data strategy cycle, it's the same thing. What can data do to best support the organizational strategy? How can I use this new constraint 
to most effectively gain more out of my existing system? How can I get things out of the way so that this constraint can really shine? Uh, how can I now use the value that has come in that organization to further improve the productivity of whatever constraint I'm attempting to relieve the capacity of? And again, lather, rinse, and repeat. Once again, though, if you think about this, this should look an awful lot to you like plan, do, check, act, the famous Deming quality cycle. And once again, I think that's a really good way to do it. If they haven't heard of the goal, they will absolutely her have heard of Deming and quality cycles and plan, do, check, act. So a very good way of picking up and leveraging existing things rather than having to come up with a brand new methodology, which isn't going to do anything other than what you're dealing with already here. Uh, we've got a, a few more minutes here as we get back to the top of the hour, but I want to particularly draw your attention to the way in which most people go about this. And if you haven't seen this wheel here before, it's literally my fault. Uh, we produced this first version in 2009, and now the second edition, 2017, it's called the Data Management Body of Knowledge, the DIMBOK wheel. Now, by the way, I'm looking for people to help us with uh, all of these things, because this is when you take a bunch of data geeks together and talk about their strategy, we end up saying, well, PIMBOK called theirs the PIMBOK, so we'll call ours the DIMBOK, right? Well, we might be able to do better on that, but that's a separate area as well. The, the goal, of course, is to look at this diagram and see data management encompassing 11 separate practice areas centered around data governance, one of the 11 uh, in order to do that. There's a couple of things wrong with this diagram here, and I think it's okay to critique ourselves and try to challenge it to do better. So I'm challenging you all. One of two things this diagram doesn't show as data people, dependencies and sequencing uh, around this uh, optionality. So one of the things that happens here is that people look at this wheel and they say, oh my God, as a data strategy, I have to do something for document and content management. No, you don't. What we were trying to say here is that this wheel has these 11 practice areas in it. And that if you're doing things with document and content management, they should be considered from a data management perspective. But I do understand how people could look at this and say, oh my goodness, uh, you know, I must do all these things. No, these are optional activities that you can do. And the other part I mentioned before was the dependency as well. It's probably a good idea to start with governance and then work out from there. Um, but depending on where your organization is in its journey, any of these may be good starting places to get started. Let's take a look at sort of three iterations around a relatively common set of activities, which is that the organization is saying, I'm gonna pull some things together because I wanna do more with my data. Well, rather than think of this as I need to have something that goes on in all 11 areas, I like to think of structural dependency. Uh, think of it as a three-legged stool. If I had a stool that was two legs, it wouldn't work. It was one leg, it wouldn't work. If I had four, it would work. But three is a good number. Three is a really good number. And what you want to think of from a strategy perspective here is that my characteristic, the business problem that I'm attempting to solve, is going to be going into a different sort of a category here. Uh, we're going to do this for once. And we'll look at it from warehousing and quality management and governance. But then the next time we go through it, we may discover that we should have been looking at metadata in addition to data quality. Now I get two pluses for the uh, data warehousing and data governance pieces, but one X each for data quality and metadata. Finally, perhaps our third time says, maybe we really should look at this as a formal reference and master data type of activity here. So this is how you can pull these things into play and get them to start working in a fashion that will work in a much more concrete way than it will if you're trying to do all of it or just one of it. Three is a really good number on that. So again, remember, strategy helps your data program over time increase capacity and improve operations and change our focus from reactive to proactive around this. And once you've gotten good with one group of people who are doing this well, you can now start to look at improving that process and spinning off other cycles that you can implement in order to gain some multitasking uh, around the whole activity.
So we spent some time here. We're just about at the top here. Data strategy specifies how data assets are to be used to support the organizational strategy. You now know that strategy is much better implemented as a process than a product, that you know that data strategy is the thing that you do to make data more useful for the strategy of the organization. That's how they work together. And that if you want to improve your organization's data, you need also to improve the way people use that data in order to support strategy. If you don't look at those second two steps in that process, you will not have good success. Finally, lack of organizational readiness, failure to compensate for data competencies, and eliminating the barriers to leveraging data are three things that people have to do in order to do more with your data. Finally, we get to the iterations part, lather, rinse, and repeat. This is, again, Malcolm Gladwell's quote, practice isn't the thing that you do uh, uh, once you're good. Practice is the thing you do to get good in order to do that. So again, bottom line up front, Large amounts of investments in a physical strategy that's a written document are generally less useful than the process of instead trying to get better about working your way into all of these activities in here. And again, finally, cycling through, cycling through these series of improvements uh, in order to do that. And we are right back at the top of the hour. And if you want to know what Bruce Springsteen is, you'll have to ask that because that's a completely different question. Shannon, we're back to you and uh, invite Shawning back in. Peter, thank you so much. And Sean, thank you so much for these great presentations and for kicking off the webinar new year with this amazing talk. Uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, along with anything else requested throughout. We had a couple questions come in, uh, starting with Sean's presentation. Um, so would you need data mesh first in order to ensure the business meaning of the data is understood and documented before data fabric can use that metadata and deliver quality data? Uh, so the short answer is no, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think it's a question of going for one, you know, whether you think about data meshes or data fabrics. Um, I, I really see them as um, uh, methods to achieve um, helping you understand your your metadata. Um, I think uh, you know putting together. Actually, this has been a wonderful talk, and I've really enjoyed listening to it. Given the um, given my own experience of customers and where they are on these journeys, and and what a dramatic difference it makes. Um, and bringing this back to, to metadata, I think putting in place a strategy for for um, understanding your metadata is is paramount and it, it and it's and it's orthogonal to whether you're choosing to use a data mesh approach or a, a data fabric approach or some kind of hybrid of both which is actually closer in my opinion to the reality uh there are other kind of more tactical um approaches that are within those wider approaches to dealing with uh, metadata but having good metadata is one of the most important things you can do um to sort of set yourself up to to, to be able to succeed further down the line with things that build on the metadata. But I don't think you should rush out and say, I'm, I've got to do a data mesh therefore, um, before I can fix my metadata. Uh, I think you can, you can uh, look at metadata discreetly and, um, and look at the practices around that specifically. Um, so that's, that's where I stand on that. And Sean, let me add a, a piece onto that as well. Is there anything in what I'm showing on the screen here now where the graphs wouldn't be useful? Uh, probably not. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, the, the thing about a graph is, is it really mirrors the way we think. I think that's why people like them. They like to see the pictures. Um, there's a certain practical element where it's just too much overkill and, and uh, it's more than you need. Uh, you know, we think associatively, in general, as humans, and this thing's connected to that thing, and, and everything in the end is connected through through relations to everything else. So, a graph is a very natural way of expressing things. From a technical point of view, it only makes sense to really go to the trouble of putting that into software for for problems where where it makes sense. But I, um, uh, so, I, I wouldn't necessarily. Um, uh, maybe document a strategy as a graph, but some people do if they if they have a complex enough strategy where it actually merits the effort. Um, 
So there's a little bit of, we're naturally attracted to graphs and sometimes they're the right actual technology to use and sometimes they're, they're overkill or there's, there's more practical say, uh, solutions or may, maybe more historical solutions that are better proven and so on. And I, I want to emphasize also the first book that Sean talked about at the end of his uh, introduction there is a free download and it is such a useful book. We've used it in class here at the university and I know several other uh, data professionals that swear by it as well. So uh, just reemphasize if you do do not get a chance do anything else, go download that look uh, that book there because it's a, a really great overview. Thank you, Peter. Actually, uh, when it comes to metadata, that book does tend to start with the metadata and how graph technology can really help you with a metadata strategy. Not just graph technology, but the the knowledge and semantic technologies that are often part and parcel of knowledge graphs. So there's a fair amount in that book which describes how to get started with a, a, um, a metadata strategy. You know, the, the, what, how does one actually get an organization going to, to repair, repair usually the chaos within them um, and, and come up with something coherent? So we, 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 me and my co-authors really tried hard to, to come up with some ideas about how, you know, what, what you're aiming for and how you get started with that. Because um, it, it does tend to start whatever you, whichever kind of um, part of this journey you're you're uh, you're attempting to to go on, metadata will in, inevitably be a some some part of that which will uh, could could be the the difference between sex, success and failure. For sure, for sure. Is data fabric similar to semantic layer? Uh, they're often used synonymously, yes, and also knowledge layer. So the answer there is yes, we, we see customers calling them um, all of those things. Um, uh, data fabric is sometimes less than a semantic layer as well. Though. When, um, when often from competitive vendors who have, have less of a semantic um, bent to their products, um, um, and by semantic, I tend to mean semantics based on standards from the W3C. So standards that allow you to um, uh, really describe data in a way that makes it abstracted from the systems that created it. You know, today, um, systems that generate data are, tend to be generating it in a fairly idiosyncratic manner based on however the people who develop that system uh, decided was the best model internally for that application or wherever the whatever's generating the data. The standards from the W3C allow you to describe the data in a way that is neutral to applications and abstracts it and, and therefore um, uh, future-proofs it. So when I talk about semantics, I really mean knowledge representations that are based on standards that we can, that we, which where the data will be understandable 20 years from now, long after the software that generated it is, is gone. Um, so, um, and other people have a lesser definition of semantic usually you know, around enterprise dictionaries and taxonomies and more informal organized but within their businesses but but, but organized um but that don't translate as easily directly to to a, a standard representation for meaning um that can be shared with other organizations very easily um so there are plenty of semantic layers out there but not all of them are equal uh, I did put a link to the books in the chat for everybody. So you have that again. And it's also in the slides, which I'll send out as well. Um, so uh, could data graphs be used for project portfolio management to show interconnection between different projects and programs? I have certainly seen that um, uh, in the in engagements we've been in. And I've seen people modeling. Currently, people are very interested in modeling um, carbon footprints and um, you know, sort of representations of dependencies and things. So um you know it can definitely be done but i would also say that you need the the amount the volume of that to be worth the the, the trouble you know everybody starts usually with excel and it's good to go for a while um, but at some point it becomes um a bit a bit of a black box a bit too brittle at that point you start looking for tools to help you uh, maybe then it's time to start thinking about a um uh, a, a, a knowledge graph way of representing it, but often uh, domains have very excellent applications that uh, 
you know, project management tools have ways of, of interlinking projects and dependencies and so on. Sometimes you're better off sticking with a, a custom application. So I can guess the message is, yes, it can be done. I have seen it being done, but um, I wouldn't do it until you feel like it's worth the investment. Okay, so, so how do we validate the cost of data? Um, American, if for example, your American airline example, Peter, you know, how do you come up with the cost of data as well to justify investment in data programs? Well, you can be absolutely certain that the president of American Airlines and United are trying to figure that out because, of course, they are remunerated based on the value of the company. So anything they can do to, to push the value of the company up higher. And, you know, wouldn't you think in the last two years they would have done that at this point if they knew how to? But they don't. Um, so the, the question comes back to it, saying that there's lots and lots of data in our organizations, but the value of this data has not been well understood. And I think this one will play right into Sean's uh, example that he was talking about a minute ago. I knew of an instance where I had uh, uh, two individuals were working for a chemical company kind of thing, and they would have lunch every day and just, you know, good friends and things like that. But they never talked about work at lunch until they both went off to the same conference and one of the, the friends went up and said, hey, I've invented chocolate. And the, the, the friend down in the audience is going, wait a minute, I've got peanut butter here. We should have had this conversation 10 years ago. Uh, a knowledge graph is something that will help people to start thinking about what those cross project data selections, collections, whatever you're pulling together can be. So it's showing out more uh, ideas around it. Similarly too, Everybody knows the adage that a blank screen is the hardest thing for anybody to face, right? Oh my God, I've got to write a paper in the morning or whatever it is. Instead, what, what you do with the knowledge graph is that you put things out there and say, look, sometimes these are correct, sometimes they're incorrect, but we want you to use this type of thinking and everybody likes to be an editor. So they'll come in and look at this and say, oh, I, this tells a story, right? Data models are some of the most boring things in the world to look at because uh, they don't do anything where the knowledge graph actually shows something getting done uh, around that. John, want to add anything to that? I, I actually couldn't agree more. Quite a number of the projects we're involved in are variations of what you just said. You know, it, maybe it's a, a manufacturer of, you know, some complex instrument wanting to provide uh, a, an experience for the engineers in the field who, uh, who are going out to repair this thing or service it. And they need all the different aspects related to this particular instance of this particular machine at this particular customer at their fingertips. And that's a whole wide variety of things that comes from lots of different parts of the business. You know, there's going to be the manuals related to the machine. There's going to be the service history of that particular machine. There's going to be maybe some some backwards and forwards between um, the customer having called to the customer service line, and maybe it's just some, just some, you know, some conversations you want to understand this, what the sentiment is and maybe the content. You know, that's just one example, right? Another where the connecti connectivity allows that individual to, to be able to deliver a really much better experience to the end customer. A similar kind of backbone in terms of things wanting to, to to be able to remember and retrieve things through their connections is, could be mining, um, mining, uh, you know, conference uh, papers and, and, and speeches uh, to understand who experts in a particular field are, or who or who's influencing who. Uh, one of our customers uh, uses that kind of information to send the right kind of information to uh, to doctors um, at the right time to um, to help them, you know, understand why a particular drug might be what they should be prescribing more of. Again, it's it's this notion of how, building these structures that link everything together to be able to ask questions that then um, drive action uh, and deliver value to the business. So th these are just variations on exactly what you've said, uh, Peter. All right, next question, Janet. Awesome. Uh, so what is a good maturity model to use for understanding the current state of the organization's data maturity? This allows an organization objectively determine where they are today and where they want to be and develop an achievable plan to get there with people, process, and technology with in a, a, an allowable budget. So I'm 
even though I have to say that I started, I think, the field of measuring data management maturity with a paper in a scientific journal back in the aughts uh, around this. I am so tired of people putting overemphasis on maturity. An assessment for your organization, particularly if you know your organization isn't stellar, is kind of, you know, well, I guess the question would be, is it worth a lot of money for somebody to tell you that you're not very good? And I, I don't think the answer to that is yes. Um, what I would use assessment for is to try and find instances of common shared data or shareable data, and also to find best practices in your organization that you can leverage. Uh, I'm actually responding literally these days to an RFP for a company that says, hey, we're going to go digital, blah, 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 Sean, I'm sure you've seen it as well. And they have not even spoken to their data people to say, what is it that we already have that we should build on? Now, I happen to know their data environment really, really well. And it turns out we're probably going to win this particular uh, you know, RFP because of our knowledge in this. But it's sad when we have to, as an external consultant, come in and show the organization that they're actually doing some of this pretty well or the organization wouldn't be in, in good shape. So there's lots of literature on maturity models and things like that. I would keep your maturity assessment focused on two things. One, what do you have that can be shareable or shared data that you can emphasize and start to, to do things towards? And two, what are the areas in your organization that are already working well and that should be further exploited? And gosh, if this sounds an awful lot like the theory of constraints, it actually works out to be there. Sean, you may have a completely different take on, on maturity assessments. What's your thoughts? My thoughts are we see it further, further downstream. You know, we're at the point mm -hmm. where someone's actually trying to do something. And, um, and Candidly, a great many of these things fail because they do not have the data they think they do, or it's not obtainable in a way that uh, you know that is is necessary to actually achieve whatever is the combination that they want to put together to add some business value. So often the businesses really are um, are uh, unaware of their of their the state of their data in many cases, or at least parts that we sometimes engage with. And then the other place that these things fail is where where the business, the sort of technical people are not really, don't really have a good understanding of what would drive business value to the business side. Um, and often we'll deliver a solution and then it'll disappoint, not because it doesn't do what, what we were asked to do with it, but because nobody cares. It doesn't deliver the business value that they were expecting because they didn't understand what would have you know what the uh, what what would have driven business value, which of course for us is is very disappointing. So we're kind of further, you know, we're on the receiving end of these issues, <laughs> um, uh, and um, and often it, it ends up being um, really a disappointment for us because we love to see our software being useful and 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 delivering uh, value. Um, and if you if you end up sort of three quarters of the way into a project and realize we're just never going to get the data needed, then um, uh, to, to deliver what their vision, the customer's vision is, then it's, it's, it's deeply disappointing. And, and time to pull a plug too, right? Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. No, sometimes you can do a customer a big favor by saying this ain't gonna work, right? Uh, you, you, yes, and it's it's far better to do that earlier if you can. And we try. I mean, you know, you know, we, Cambridge Semantics was a startup, and you have to learn. In a startup, you learn everything the hard way. And it took quite a few years for us to really um, make sure that the people we were engaged with, um, who had the whatever the idea was, or often they don't have an idea, right? With the new technology, they're just kicking the tires to see what it might be able to do for them. Uh, which there's nothing wrong with that because that's how you find out. But but they often don't have a, a any Velcro in the business. And um, even though there may be some budget to do those experiments, they, they never figure out how to connect back to the business. So we've got much better at sort of uncovering that and qualifying. Uh, so we make sure now that we we think that there's a, a they're there before we get too too engaged uh, um, in in projects because uh, you know we're, we're we can only do so many projects and uh, and we really want them all to succeed and be you know a success for everybody and a super description of an organizational capability. We've got the ability to look at an organization and say, you know, that project's probably not going to work. So as much as we'd love to sell you some software, uh, you know, we're going to tell you now you need to go back and do some more homework before it's time to, to go invest in technology at this point. You need some in, internal capabilities. 
Yeah, we tend to say it more gently than that. I mean, the ideal is if you help the customer realize that themselves um, uh, by asking for, you know, we need this kind of data or that kind of data or how are you going to do this? And as they, as they work on it themselves, they realize where, where the deficiencies are. Um, but uh, it's, 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 the data is, is still, um, in many ways, the great unsolved problem in nearly every business that uh, we've, we've, we've uh, come in contact with. Okay, so should a data strategy be part of a digital strategy? To put it another way, should those people developing a data strategy wait for the digital strategy first? Absolutely not. Uh, I would do it the other way around. So um, one of the things that was really kind of interesting to learn was that, you know, we're all locked away while during the recession. And yet I managed to have a hallway or a water cooler conversation with a, a good friend of mine at one point on one of these uh, events. Uh, the guy's named Mark Johnson. He's out of, of Ohio. And he, he wrote down two things. He, he wrote down data and then underneath it, he wrote down digital. And then he wrote down digital and underneath it wrote down data. And he said, if you take digital away from data, you still have data. But if you take data away from digital, I'm not sure what that leaves you with. So it's this sort of shorthand way of saying you cannot do digital, literally, unless you have the data in the right shape. And as John was saying, he's seen lots and lots of, of organizations that struggle with this because it is a hard thing to do. The number one cause I have seen is people starting digital first and then getting into it and then discovering, oh, I've got a data problem and there's no budget to fix the data. So that's where things sort of run out of steam. But again, everybody has different experience. Sean, what's yours? Uh, exactly that. I mean, I <laughs> couldn't agree with, more, with you more. I really couldn't. It's, um, you know, people in the business have a vision. They they see something, um, I don't know, something in, sparks an idea of something that they think could be could be very valuable to their business. And then um, and then it often flounders simply because there is not a, a digital strategy, sorry, a data strategy that, that can actually support that. And in the end, individual projects are usually not enough to fix a, a, a data strategy. Um, you can you know start small and, and 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 use that as a way to teach people data strategy, but it it doesn't fix the overall organization status data strategy. So unless unless it's coming down from a very high level, maybe through a CDO or from a board level, um, data strategy tends to be um, uh, tends to be kind of um, a little bit uh, ignored, and and it's and individual projects aren't usually enough to, to aren't valuable enough to fix it. Um, and, and so you, if I can, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, finish. Uh, well, all, all I was going to say is that sometimes you can sort of get lucky and patch things up and, and you know, put you know, user technology like ours to kind of pull data from every which way. But invariably, there are gaps that um, end up being, you know, conceptually uh, uh, missing lines on that graph. And and if you don't have those those lines and you can't, there's no data to fill them in. Then then you really you 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 that's where your project craters. And and to build on your point there too, this gets to one of the things that I tried to emphasize in the talk as well. If your organization does not have a programmatic effort to support data, and a programmatic effort means you have a leader that's in charge, they have an annual budget, it may not be increasing. You know, the CIO's budgets are always decreasing going forward. That's just a fact of life in today's IT world uh, around this. But to throw money at, at other things makes no sense whatsoever. So make sure that data exists at the programmatic level and that same focus there, programmatic means it's going to be made up of multiple projects. And then you're not trying to make a program out of a bunch of projects, you're instead creating a program and then creating your projects from that as well. So again, Sean, I think that just absolutely uh, reinforces that point here. These things have to be done at a, an organizational level. Uh, again, I'm old and cranky, so it's kind of nice. Uh, I can you know, choose what customers and, and friends and projects and things I, I get to work on. And oftentimes I'll see a, a, an organization and they'll say, well, we're just gonna do data as a project, but you, know, you can still help us out. Say, nope, I'm gonna put my time and effort into something that I think is gonna be actually something that will move the needle somewhere, somewhere for somebody, as opposed to just wasting your money on a, a bunch of spend. 
Sorry, I get really, really uh, frustrated with that one, but uh, you've probably been there too, Sean. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So do you think we should bring in data contracts and data observability as part of this framework? Well, now, are they asking about the DIMBOK framework? Sure, that's the most frequent question I get at DEMA. If, if I let everybody who put a, a pie wedge in, our pie wedge would have, uh, we'd have 100 pie wedges at this point. Uh, there are, that's a different effort. We're going to talk about that in DEMA to go forward here. But as far as strategy goes, I think it's important to, to look at this as saying, I've got an organizational strategy, and most organizations then filter that strategy through the IT organization, so then they have an IT strategy, and then the data strategy is the third piece of it. Well, that's got to change. Again, if we are trying to do data based on a lens that is looking at the world through an IT perspective, that is not a programmatic perspective and will not result in good activities. Instead, we have to break that strategy out and make it directly supportive of that, just the same way as we need to break data leadership out and not report through a CIO in most cases, and in fact, go directly to the, the board or the chief executive level, whatever it is. Uh, in fact, just a quick little note for those of you that aren't in the federal government, it is now against the law in the federal government to have a CDO reporting to a CIO. Uh, most people don't think that Congress passes those kind of laws, but I think they let this one go through for just us data dinks uh, a little while ago. That's another topic. We can get into that later on. I know we're getting close to the end here. Yeah, time for more questions, Shannon? Oh, we do that? actually yeah sorry i thought i hit the, <laughs> the mute button there um just we have just a couple more questions and i think we have time to fit one or two more in so okay. you know at the beginning we you know got the question about uh data fabric and semantic later um but is a semantic layer also the same as a data mesh uh, I, well I, I would say that they're they're somewhat orthogonal, having done a little bit of reading now. I think the people who implemented data mesh probably will end up or would like to end up eventually with the data fabric. Um, I think data mesh is more philosophical. It's about the process for, um, it's essentially decentralizing the process of delivering quality data to the organization to lots of different places. And those different places are individually responsible for their, their domain of data and making it available for the rest of the organization. Um, and uh, that is, whereas the data fabric is about consuming those. Uh, so I'm, I'm starting to see them as two sides of a coin that people would like to get to in an ideal state. Um, um, you know, you, you wanna make data reusable and generally the people who are most able to do that are where the data is being made, they understand it best, they will describe it best. Um, a data fabric simply uh, draws together uh, blends of that data from different sources. And if those sources are there and available and have SLAs, that's a great thing. So I, I, I you know, I, I see these two, two ideas, not as really distinct architectures, but, but complementary parts of an overall process where you end up with sort of uh, data nirvana in, the, in an enterprise. Now, I think we, we're a long way from that, but um, uh, I, I really don't see them as antagonistic at all. Um, and John, I don't mean to, to contradict anything, just a, a word of note that Gartner in its hype cycle for 2022 last year actually declared data mesh obsolete. I'm not sure what they're basing that on, um, but it is something you should at least know about uh, as they go forward here. And of course, we all know that Gardner isn't always right. So uh, well, maybe we'll have a happy I, result on that. The, the, the more reading I do, I see the data mesh more of as a philosophy. And, and I'm seeing people who are, you know, practitioners in data doing these assemblages that we're, we're, I mean, we're neutral. We don't really care what the underlying sources of data are. We just glad to have it. Um, but I, I'm seeing a lot of the same practices that I've been reading about as data mesh practices being 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 done by people who are building knowledge graphs. And some of those people are, are absolutely building their knowledge graphs with an eye to making them part of a, a wider fabric. So I'm just not mm -hmm. seeing, uh, I'm not seeing the, um, I don't think it's dead particularly. I don't think it's, it's just a way of describing 
um, yeah, it's a model for describing a set of activities around good data practices, and 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 uh, um, and, and that's about it. Um, and what you're describing is exactly what Gardner did with big data too. Remember that was a big thing on here, and all of a sudden they just went poof. It's no longer part of this. <laughs> you know, it is well, a philosophy. Well, big data itself is still with us, obviously. I mean, mm -hmm. people, right. customers are, are are doing whatever they do, and if the data is big, then there, then it's you know but then it's big and you you have to have technology to handle it's um but I, I don't think it's quite the sort of center of attention that it has been or was sort of 10 years ago so again Gardner's not always right so please don't take this as gospel this is just what they're pushing out okay so we have time for we have just two minutes left so a brief very brief question and answer so um and because I'd love to hear the answer to this so and since this is my title. Um, and now we have chief digital officers. <laughs> is that a combo <laughs> of CID and CDO? I would like it to be, Sean. Uh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, so I, I'm not a good person to answer that one. Well, there's no question, just as if, if we go back, and I can remember stuff I was teaching back in the 70s, where I was saying things like, well, computers and communication and entertainment are all drawing together. And people would look at me like, what are you talking about? And of course, nowadays you have a phone and it plays movies for you. So uh, those things have happened. There's absolutely every possibility that, that what Sean is describing will mature in this way and not in the way that Gartner uh, sees it. Not that there's anything wrong with one, one version or the other, but it is a matter of, of confusion in the marketplace. And that's, I think, one of the things we all want to try to avoid uh, around that. So if we can get you know, sort of standardization, like you said, if you're if you're looking at the WC3 thing, that sort of bulletproofs your data going forward uh, from other types of, of activities or other foibles that will happen uh, in there. Other things may be exactly the same same way, and we'll see how they how they shake out over time. I love it. All right. Well, then I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for this webinar. Thank you both so much for kicking off the new year with such a great topic and presentation. I really appreciate it. Thanks to Cambridge Semantics for sponsoring today's webinar and help making these webinars happen. And just thanks, remind thanks, th thanks for having us, uh, Shannon. Oh, absolutely. And and thanks to all of our attendees for joining in. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and um, I'll call out those additional resource links, links as well for the books and everything else that um, was requested throughout. Sean and Peter, thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Sean. Pleasure to work with you. Likewise. Bye, bye everybody. Have a, have a good bye, day. Everybody. rest of your day.